I said to one of my friends the other day, you know, I think God really loves me, you know. And, and she said, oh, oh, yes, but God loves us all, you know. And I said, no, no, he loves me in a very special way because I am one of his wayward children. The Profile with Premier Christianity magazine. Hello, you're listening to Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. You've joined us for The Profile. This show is brought to you by Premier Christianity magazine, which is the magazine that I edit and contribute to. And each week here on The Profile, we like to sit down with a different Christian to find out something of their life story. And I'm really pleased to say that my guest on the show today is the Reverend Canon Eve Pitts. Canon Eve is well known as the Church of England's first black female vicar and also for her work as an activist. And earlier this month, Canon Eve was recognised at Birmingham Live's Pride of Birmingham Awards, where she received the Lifetime Achievement Award. Canon Eve Pitts, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to have you. How are you feeling yeah. after this award? What was it like to receive it? It's interesting that I haven't had the time to really think about it, partly because I have a lot of emails and a lot of people saying hello, 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 and congratulations. And I have, and that's punctuated by lots of funerals. So I have lots of funerals that I'm having to prepare people for the the service of their loved ones. So, um, yeah, I, I, it, it's when I think about it, it's quite overwhelming, really, um, because I can honestly say I've never done, I mean, I've received a lot of awards from uh, the black community, you know, the most influential black woman within the community, they say. Um, the, um, I've had an award from the Jamaican government some time ago. But I've never sat down and thought, yeah, it would have been lovely to get something for this, you know, to be recognised. I can actually say I don't think that way. So it was quite a surprise. I wouldn't have been surprised if somebody said, oh, sorry, we got the wrong person. <laughs> I did. And I said, okay, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> they um they call it they call it imposter syndrome, don't they? It's the idea that, that that you know it, it couldn't possibly be me. I'm an imposter. I don't deserve this. The, I, right. I've certainly relate to that feeling. I felt yeah, that many yeah. times in my life. I think that's quite a common um uh, uh thing in especially in the minds of women. I, I think it happens for men as well. But I know for women, it's. It is very, very um, difficult for us to accept that we are as good as people say we are. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm accepting it now, and I have brushed down the, the award, and I've made sure that there's no dust on it. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. And I, I wonder as well if what you just said it is a bit of an insight, perhaps, into what parish life is like. When you say, on the one hand, there's this wonderful level of you know the community recognizing you for your good work and, and the high of that mm -hmm. but then also the lows you mentioned you're having to prepare for, for funerals is that yeah. is that quite common as a vicar to to be there for the best moments in people's life but also the well absolutely you know um it's a it's sort of marrying people and doing the bits that we'd rather forget and and i had a baptism interview this morning so it, it's about this it's about the journey of life you know the good moments, the baptisms, the celebratory moments. And yet in the midst of that, it's punctuated by the reality of death. Yeah. And and as an Anglican priest in this uh, really busy parish, I, I do a lot of funerals. And and um I don't I don't want to get used to it. But in, in a way you have to be resigned to that. That that is part of what you do. And because of the nature of the parish, there's a lot of there are a lot of elderly people. Uh, I have to add, it's not just the elderly. I think at the moment, it's there's something we haven't yet recovered from the pandemic. There's a sense in which a lot of people are still quite ill um, in more ways than one. So yes, it, it's the rough and tumble of parish life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd love to talk a bit about um, your calling into this ministry, but before we do, we like to go back to the very beginning and mm -hmm. talk about life growing up. Now, I know you were born in Jamaica. I know mm -hmm. church was certainly a part of your childhood, wasn't it? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. I, I, grew, up, I, I grew up in um, sandwich between two denominations. 
Um, as a little girl, I was about seven years old, I would go to uh, one church with my grandfather, um, very bright man he was. And then I would um, go to my uh, my great aunt's church. <laughs> so, you know, uh, like many Caribbeans of my generation, church was an integral part of our, the way we lived. Uh, and so I went to, I loved going to church, but I, I, I got bored very easily, uh, especially if, if I, you know, I, they didn't answer the questions I wanted them to answer. So what I was, questions were you asking at, at such a young age? Well, at a very young age, I wanted to know what God was like. <laughs> so I wanted to know what God was like, and, and they would just say, "Oh well, you know, um, it doesn't really matter what He's like." Yes, it does. I, I remember. I remember being told that, um, you know, that I must just accept things, and that I was very reluctant. So, so I, I grew up in this church environment, which I absolutely loved. I have to say, um, even if my mother wasn't going to go to church, I went to church, and I was quite prepared to go to church. Uh, in Jamaica, um, I, I went to a very, um, I went to a private school, so I didn't go to school every Sunday. I, I went to the um, I, I just went um, when the, the head teachers sent us, you know. But, but um, when I came to England, um, church became very important to me once again. Mm. And I just um, took it for granted that, that uh, when my mother came or not, that I was going to be at church. I love the idea of God. And just tell me a, a little bit about the circumstances that, that led to you moving from Jamaica to the UK. What was it that, that brought you here? Well, I suppose like every Caribbean, uh, you know, especially, especially in my mother's generation, um, uh, the history, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in history. I love history and learn. I do, I, everything I do is within the context of my understanding of how have I and how did I arrive at this point in my life. But it's difficult to talk about that journey without talking about the history, I mean, unless you're going to make, play some kind of mind games. And pretend that the history uh, uh, of my people and the history of my family uh, isn't important. And clearly, it is. So, like all Caribbeans um, who came here in the fifties, as our parents did, it came as a direct result of the relationship between England and the other parts of the world, for good or for ill. And I have to say, often not for good. Um, and so, our parents came, made that treacherous, you know, emotionally demanding journey. Uh, with or without their children, and I came after, you know, yeah, and 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 it's it's quite a, a common um, journey. It's a journey of of um, rediscovering who they were, or, or they were meant to be. So I, I came like all these little girls and boys. So presumably your parents were coming first of all to sort of see if yeah that's it that was usual pattern that's usual pattern see if it's yeah, possible to make a life here and once they decided yeah it is possible to make a life here they kind of sent for you to, to come over as well yeah that's so to put simply that's how it was yeah yeah and and um that's I was a sort of a great it wasn't an adventure they, they may have thought of it as an adventure to you know initially but it was I, I expect quite traumatic for them mm -hmm. yeah. There's a big, big anniversary celebration and marking of all this. The Windrush seventy five coming up mm. this this summer. Mm, like, what are your thoughts when, as we, as the nation really marks that? Because it is, there are two very different ways of looking at it. There is a very, you know, negative way of looking at it, which is to recognise the the sins committed against that generation. We hear stories of people turned away from the Church of England, for example. Mm. There's also a sense. There's also going to be a sense of celebration, I think, come this June, of the influence of your parents' generation and your generation on the life and the culture of the UK. So, what are your thoughts as we approach that anniversary? I have mixed feelings about this. I have to say, Sam, um, because part of me want to celebrate the fact that our parents were so courageous. I mean, it took a lot of guts to actually say. I'm going to go to this place where, where it's highly unlikely that there will be many people who look like me and to cross the ocean um, and to come here. I, I, I applaud them. And I know that it was difficult for many of them, and indeed for my own parents. My, my mother didn't want to come to England because frankly, she didn't have to. She came from a, 
a, a very comfortable background. That's why I was able to go to a private school. And I think that was true for more than we realized, more people than we realized, because there's this, there's this kind of um, sort of myth about, um, you know, the, my parents' generation coming to make a better life. And, and of course, there's an, to some extent that is true. Um, but I think for many, for some, it was also um, that my father wanted to be a barrister, you know. And my mother was extremely bright, like so many um, of her generation. They were bright. They, they weren't coming to sort of live off uh, Britain because, come on, let's be frank, England had what it had because of the labor of my mother's ancestors. And so um, they came and... Uh, I think for some, it was traumatizing. It really was. And I think, I don't think, I know for certain my mother, you know, she cried and uh, and hated the whole experience of name calling and she wasn't, she just was not used to. And, uh, and I think that's true for the vast majority of that so-called Windrush old ship generation. It was an old ship, you know, I, mean, I, I have some, I have some real problems with this, this you know, um, Windrush ship that was more than likely an unpleasant journey. Right. And, uh, and they came, and some went back, I have to say. Some just went back to the Caribbean. And I, and I, re I remember my mother crying and saying, look what I've come to. Look, look what's happened to me if my father could see me now. Because, you know, she, and, I, and I, I think that, I'm sure that was not as uncommon as I, you know. I once thought. So um, I, I take my hat off to them. It, it was a difficult experience. That's an understatement. It was a painful experience for them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I refuse to do um, is to resist any attempt to glamorize the Wendraj. Mm -hmm. Nothing glamorous about it. It was a journey, an emotional journey for people who had experienced difficult things and was told, well, invited to come and then found, you know, it's like being given an invitation to a party and then when you come, there was no party, you know, yeah. and, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, and tell me a bit about your memories, I guess, childhood, teenage years of, of life growing up in the UK, the, the racism that your parents experienced, to what, to what degree were you also experiencing that? I mean, I grew up in a, I grew up with a group of um, uh, elderly academics, you know, that's the only way I can, that's the only way I can, um, I can, I can ex express it. I mean, the, the people I lived with were, um, the, especially the men in the house, while all the women were cooking, by the way, and, and cleaning up, and they were reading um, all the newspapers on a Sunday morning, you know, and they would, it, it's interesting, uh, that sort of shaped my worldview of men. You know, all these guys that would go out to the local paper shop and they would buy all the Sunday papers, the heavyweights, you know, and they would spread them out on this table while the women busied themselves cooking to go to church. <laughs> and these guys would just sit there and they would that they would just read the paper from front to back, back to front, and then they would have these long debates about the politics there. It was an amazing shaping of my life, actually. I, I, at the time, I don't think I really realized how profoundly how life shaping that this was going to be for me. But to have five black men sitting around on a Sunday and on a Saturday morning, reading the newspapers, um, and then discussing politics in front of this little girl who just drank it all in, you know, um, and I'm sure that my house wasn't the only place, but that was my experience. And it was a, a quiet house with, I was a little, only a little girl uh, in the house, protected by these group of very bright men. In fact, they were so bright, they used to call each other nicknames. One was called Prime Minister. <laughs> it, was so, it was so bright. Oh, here comes Prime Minister, you know, because <laughs> uh, he, had, he, had he had this wonderful brain. So, and then of course, after that, it was church. Um, and, and that shaped me and lots of music, of course. Mm. 
And what church, what church was this? Was this Anglican or Pentecostal? No, no, I went to a Pentecostal church, um, and um, because, and then I went to the Baptist church and because my mother wasn't really keen on churches. I wasn't afraid to to just go to the Baptist church down the road uh, and the Pentecostal church. Uh, as long as I went to church, I loved church. I grew up loving churches, and and my mother. My mother, I'm, I'm really glad that she never forced me. I went to church because I wanted to. Yeah. Some people have have stories of just, as you say, growing up around church, loving church, and that mm-hmm. is their, their Christian experience. O- other people have experiences where there was a particular moment as a child or a teenager where they, they would say their kind of faith became their own and it wasn't mm-hmm. just a family thing anymore. Did you have a moment like that where, where Christianity kind of became real for you or was it just always there? Like, it was always there. There's a sense in which that is true. But when I was about, I mean, I must have been about uh, seven, eight. I had a, I had an experience that was outside of my comfort zone, and um, and my grandmother uh, said, um, "With well, I think that was the Lord." Wow! Yeah. Tell me more. What happened? Well, I I found myself alone, and and um, I heard. A voice, and call, you know, called me, and I, uh, and interestingly, I wasn't afraid at all. I, I didn't feel frightened. Uh, and my grandmother, who was a teacher, uh, uh, knocked the door, and um, because I was supposed to be doing my homework, and I, and I was in the toilet for longer than for longer than she uh, than I ought to be in. And, and she said, um, she knocked the door. And she said, "What's the matter?" And I said. Oh, oh, I haven't been in here that long. And she said, yes, you've been there a long time. Uh, and, and what's the matter? And I told her, and she said, I think that's the Lord's called you. Um, and um, don't tell, don't say anything to anyone because uh, God will fulfill his the promise when it's the right time for you. Right. And it ain't exactly as she said, it, it happened. Was this a kind of sense you had, or was this a, an a real sense? A real sense of the presence, of the place lit up, and I couldn't understand where the light was coming from. Uh, I, I, it was a presence, a good, a good presence. I wasn't frightened. Nothing scared me. I just felt somebody was there with me, and and had made it very clear that I was supposed to be doing something. Right? I I just stood there, and it seemed as if it was. Um, just a split second. What my grandma told me it was much longer than that. Amazing. So, yeah. yeah. So as as life developed and you became an adult, I know you had a um, a career in the civil service, and then ultimately, oh. as you say, we ultimately called called into ministry. And that's amazing that that might have begun as early as aged eight. How did that call to ministry develop as an adult? What sort of things happened that led you towards ordination in the Church of England? And I think um, I, I became disillusioned with God um, from being a child of a faith, uh, a child that grew up in a faithful home. I was disillusioned with um, the world as I saw it through my young, my youthful eyes. Because I was always asking questions. I was the kind of child who wanted to know why for everything. And my poor mother would say, oh, can't you just accept what I <laughs> can't you just accept what I say? And I said, but no, I need to know why. So I became very disillusioned with um the whole concept, the whole idea of a God who knows me personally, who has some kind of personal interest in me. Um, despite the experience of the, as a, my childhood experience. There were some complex questions about the nature of God, about the God who is supposed to love all of us. And and yet the world in which I found myself didn't seem that way. It seemed um, as if there were favorites, and um, and and that God was sort of um, totally oblivious to that, and and that kind of that that began to play on my mind and began to disturb me in such a way that I I, I refused to say anything at all to God, I struggled with faith. Because when I, when you're a child, you accept uh, the explanations that you're given. Uh, and, and, and when I began to ask important questions, as I saw it, about 
God in a world of um, potential goodness, and yet there was so much that was bad around me. I refused to go to church for a while. Yeah, and um, and that was an important point, uh, part of my journey. Because I think it's okay to wrestle with God. I, I I think it's okay to ask who this God is. And when you look at the the, the culture and the experience of black people, I, I needed to know. I needed to understand. Um, how do I um apply it the way I live? to a God who seems distant. And so um, it, it was a battle. I, I call it my wilderness experience. Mm. And, 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 and it was a wilderness experience. It was a time when I, I, I felt totally abandoned by God, this, this sense that God didn't care about the crucial questions that I asked about the nature of the world. And um, so I drifted, and 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 I think, well, I think in a strange way, looking back on reflection, that was a good point. That was it was a good, it was good that that happened. That I dared to ask, um, because what I didn't want, and never have wanted, and never will want, is that I cannot ask questions about the nature of God. Yeah. And and my mother was despairing about it. You know, can't you just have said no? Not a bit of So, but but I did I did get this real sense, you see, that God didn't mind. It wasn't God's problem at all. Yeah. It was those around me. They had the problem with me daring, daring to say, uh. So where are you in this? It strikes me that sometimes sometimes the scriptures are more honest about this than the average Christian. I mean, after all, we've got entire entire psalms saying, God, where are you and why is yes, this going wrong? Absolutely. Why won't you rescue me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yet yeah. some something has, has terrorized us into um submitting and sort of refusing to allow any doubt at all. God is totally capable of looking after him or herself. And that has always been my, my position. I don't have to protect God from my, my, my rage <laughs> when, I, yeah. when I throw something at him or her and just say, well, this doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And, and I still do that because, you know, I'm always asking fresh questions about life. And of course, there are moments of peace so I don't always have a battle with God. It's not always a sort of, you know, a raging battle with God. I do have moments when um, I, I, I said to, I said to one of my friends the other day, you know, um, I think God really loves me, you know, and, and, and she said, oh, oh yes, but God loves us all, you know. And I said, no, no, He loves me in a very special way, because I am one of His wayward children. I dare to disobey him. <laughs> I said, and so she said, oh, she said, I always wonder how you manage to get away with the things you say to God. <laughs> well, I, and I really believe that, Sam. I believe that, um, that God, in his or her gentleness, sees my despair and understands that. And so, I never feel I am disrespecting God. I am the child who challenges and say, I need to know why this is happening. And um, so I never felt that um, that God is going to do something terrible to me because I had um, one of my, my spiritual tantrums, you know. Yes. Absolutely, it's good to it's good to ask questions, and we c and I can relate to that in asking why. I think I think a lot of people can, and um, it's interesting you had that that period of doubt, but as you say, it was good for you ultimately, and so presumably you you came to a point where oh yeah, where you felt like you you wanted to and you could go forward for ordinations. It sounds it sounds like you're questioning. It wasn't so much questioning whether God exists. It was oh, more, that was it was. Yeah. It was more God does exist. I'm just having an argument with him. Yeah, it's, 
it's, it's just and understanding the nature of God and how God works, you know, and in all this, in all the complexities. I mean, I I, I went to work in um in, in, in a parish as a parish uh, worker, youth worker, and and um it was an exciting time with lots of kids who were sort of uh, totally different to what I was as a child growing up, out of control, unloved in some cases. And I was in my element at All Saints Church in Nottingham. I was just, um, I loved it. I loved being amongst, among the children who, who nobody wanted to love, or it seemed as if no one loved. Black, white, Irish, English, Caribbean. I, I worked at All Saints and just uh, knew that the church was for me. And I, I'm, 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 uh, my boss was an Anglican priest, um, Paul Watts. And I one day just went into the church and to All Saints and had a similar experience to the one I had in, 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 in Jamaica. And, and just wet like a baby, inexplicably, just wet. And, 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 and knowing and understanding in my head and in my, and in my heart that something had happened, that an encounter had taken place. Do you understand me? An encounter had taken place. I didn't see anything. I just felt an overwhelming sense that God was present. So I sobbed and locked the church door with my half-eaten sandwich <laughs> and just sobbed. And and there was somebody at the door going, I just didn't answer. I I was almost forbidden. Answer, do not answer. This was a special moment. And um, it was then that I knew, I just knew, that God had caught up with me. <laughs> After all the years of just saying, oh, get lost and just leave me at home. <laughs> God had caught up with me. Too many of us are living in a bubble and not hearing both sides of the world's important stories. It's time for a more rounded perspective. Balanced. Relevant. Discover fresh biblical perspectives as we bring you wide-ranging stories that impact the church. Wherever you live, however you worship. Discover the go-to source for Christian news. Subscribe now at premierchristianity.com. Now only five pounds for three months. God caught up with you, entered ministry in the Church of England. You've since been described, despite being a vicar in the Church of England, you've since been described as a fierce critic of the Church of England. Is that fair? I, I, wouldn't, I don't like the word fierce. I'm a contradict critic. The Church of England, and um, and if you love something, and and if you love one of the great things that I love about being an Anglican, um, it's the freedom to think. I like that. No, I don't like. That. I love that. That gives me a deep sense of intellectual, spiritual freedom, which matters to me, and maybe that's why I didn't settle in any other church. Um, and and so. Yes, I, I, I criticize, but not empty criticism. It's about how do you make something that is good better? And and obviously the Anglican Church is is a broad church. Church mm. is broad. And that was clearly an attraction for you. It, it strikes me actually even theologically in something you've said a couple of times in this interview so is perhaps a good example of that. You referred to God and you said, he or she when speaking of God. And and you'll know as well as I do that there are um, other church streams and denominations, probably including the, the Pentecostal church you would have grown up in, where, where that language would be objectionable. And people would say, well, most of the time in scripture, God is referring to himself as he. And so we therefore should call God he rather than she. Now, clearly yeah. in Ag Anglicanism, there's more of a breadth on that question. So is there a sense in which theologically for you, Anglican Church is a good home for you because you can explore the edges of that particular theological question about the gender of God in a way that you perhaps couldn't in other streams. I, I, absolutely, I mean, I you know I've never made a, a secret of that. Um, I, I I find the absence and the, the invisible invisibility of of uh, women in um, 
other denominations are very difficult. It's this invisibility I I I don't handle when I I refuse to handle that um uh, and the language which um so often ignore the, the presence of women. You know I I I, I can't cope with that. And I, one of the things that I do love, uh, you're quite right, about the Church of England is that, um, you know, I can, I, I can look at a piece of writing or a hymn, and and insert myself into it. And and for so long as a child and as a young woman growing up, the the writing and and the the, the, the hymns and the, the the sermons excluded me and excluded women, and I think. For me, that is not good, and um, I'm, I probably it is highly likely that I probably wouldn't call for the Church of England had that not been the case. I, I love the language, which when I was ordained as a priest, I, I remember feeling how do we then come into the church and um, not become radical, but to become sensitive to the presence of God makes male and female. And for me, that was, and still is, very important. And you made history as the first black female vicar in the Church of England. What was your feeling on that question, both at the time and now? Because some might say, wonderful historic moment. I imagine some others might say, but, you know, it, it took too long. Or, you know, is this is this something to be celebrated in that sense? Uh, how do you feel about that question of, of you being the Church of England's first black female vicar? Is that something you're proud of? I you know, I've never given it a thought. Um, I sort of when the answer people remind me, you've never given it a thought. But surely, really. surely this is something that you know. I'm not telling you anything you didn't know already. You knew you were the first female black vicar, sure. Yeah, I was the first Caribbean. Yes, and but once I got past that, I went on with a job. <laughs> I just I mean, once I sort of said, okay, fine, that's really good. I'm really glad to hear that. I, it was. It has its difficulties. It was difficult at times. It was there were times that I thought. I felt a bit like a trophy, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, when I, once I got past that, it's um, I got on with with um, because I didn't want just to be defined as a black woman. I wanted to be defined and to be seen as a woman, a priest who happens to be a woman, and happens to be black or black and woman, and so um, that limits you, you know, if you're just defined by you know, a woman or a person. And bigger than that, I am this vibrant, gorgeous human being um, who sets her sights really high to make sure things happen. And I am thankful for the, um, this privileged position of priesthood um, in all its sacrificial message, if you like, sacrifice of one gives, gives oneself sacrificially to something that I you know, this, to this call that is above me and beyond me. What's been the best day of your ministry and what's been the worst? All my best days are Sunday. <laughs> I last Sunday. <laughs> Brilliant. You know what? I've interviewed an awful lot of vicars and I've asked that question before. No one has ever said that before. That's a brilliant answer. My best days are Sundays. I love being with the people of God. I love doing what I do. And I love being able to journey with the people of God. I, I get a real high from that. I mean, gosh, am I supposed to? Oh, yeah, yeah I guess so. I'm supposed to. Oh, no. And, and yes, I do. I mean, I take a lot of funerals and I take a lot of weddings and baptisms over the years. Heaven knows I have. And I love people. And I think I think if you don't like people, then you're in the wrong job. Right? Okay. I love people. I love the idea that I can persuade it because I'm good with words. I mean, it's sort of, I can persuade somebody that God loves them. You know, that's just one way. That's my way. Um, I get terribly excited on a Saturday night. <laughs> oh, I'm going to church tomorrow. <laughs> I think it's God because I grew up in church. The Sunday mornings are very special for me. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like you're in the right job to me. Uh, <laughs> Sundays is the highlight. What we have to do now is uh, we have to do now is clear away the misconception that vicars only work one day a week. Oh gosh! And you just sort of turn up on a Sunday. Um, but I, you know, I sort of it's like a countdown for me, you know, because I sort of think, okay, 
and I've got funeral to do, and I've got a baptism to do, and I've got this to do. And then there's Saturday, and I will make sure I finish off my sermon, and then whoopee, Sunday is here. And because I love, and I repeat myself, the love of people, the joy of sharing something that I believe in passionately, and to share that with um with with others is a delight, an absolute delight. And so they're the best days. Sundays are the best days. What are the most challenging days? Oh no. I think I think one day can be difficult. Because once you come out of Christmas Sunday, then you I begin to um interact with human beings again so I can talk about Sunday with some authenticity. So normally I go out on a Monday and I, I walk the streets and I um uh, I try not to look idle. <laughs> you know. I walk and I talk to human beings so I can prepare myself. And I, I get most of my inspiration on the, on, on the street or on the bus. Um, so I can, Monday can be a flat day because I, I suppose I get so worked up and excited about Sunday. That's what Monday can be a bit flat day. Mm. Yeah. There was, um, there was one particularly, I suppose, difficult point in your ministry I'd love to hear a bit more about, which is when your bishop asked you to resign, the Bishop of Birmingham at the time. Can you tell us a bit about what happened? Oh, well, it's, it's, I, that's, that's something I don't talk about, really. Uh, I shall talk about it one day. Probably, yeah. Oh, wow. My understanding is it was... It was a difficult time. You started to talk, really, about difficult issues around race, and presumably the Church of England wasn't, wasn't ready to have that conversation? Wasn't ready, probably. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's highly likely. You have been outspoken in parts of the media about the Church of England and race specifically. Um, you've said that there's even, a, I guess, an apologetics issue where you said Christianity has been used in the past to put black people into new chains. You spoke about there was a brand of Christianity in history that was rooted in white supremacy on the on plantations, for example. Now, in the world, and that's an undeniable, that's an undeniable fact, you know. If you take out, if you take out um, parts of the Bible, so you can persuade people that they um, they were born to be slaves, then you know that's serious editing, really, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So, and so, uh, yeah, you have to acknowledge that you can't have a, you really can't have an honest conversation unless you know one, uh, you you look at that and say, well, yes. This is not made up, you know. I didn't. I haven't got an overactive imagination. This was a fact, and then you have to ask the reason. Uh, you know, so how, what kind of mind games do you want to play with yourself um, in your head um, in order to do that? So you can, um, you can do what you like with a particular group of people, and and I think that's a serious issue that I can't skip over. I have no desire to skip over it at all. Um, because it's not made up. It's not something I haven't got an overactive imagination. Um, that was a fact. And if it's true then that at one point in your ministry, the church ring wasn't willing to have that conversation and, you know, it landed you in some personal difficulty. Do you think mm -hmm. it's willing to have that conversation now? I think we're moving closer. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a long time, but, um, we're getting there. Um, there's still more work to do. But um, credit where credit is due. Yeah, we are beginning to not just give empty words. Um, there, you know, and but we it takes courage to face the, the unkind things in our world and our lives. It takes a lot of courage to do that, and that's what we need in the church. And people, uh, black, white, of courage, if we are going to move the church forward uh, in a way that um gives us hope for a better future. One example of this is the Church of England announcing very recently um, a £100 million compensation fund. It's not been described as, as reparations because this money is not going to compensate individuals, but the Church of England has set aside this money to support projects that, quote, are focused on improving opportunities for communities adversely impacted by historic slavery. What did you make of that announcement that this £100 million is being set aside for that purpose? 
But you know, I tried, and at the time when I saw it, I tried very hard not to think too much about it because uh, purely on the basis that um, no one can ever compensate me for what happened. You know, the, the damage is still here for all to see. And for those of us who, who think deeply about these subjects, the damage is there and no amount of money um, can deal with that. I, I get really sort of worried about, you know, um, uh, when we start to talk about figures, because it um, makes little sense to me. You said earlier that um, more needs to be done. What practically do you have in mind? If it's if discussing figures is perhaps not helpful, what would be helpful? What more does need to be done? Yeah, I always try to resist any attempt um, that is made consciously or otherwise to find the answer and the solution for racism. It is not, but rather crudely, I suppose, it is not my problem. And I think my brothers, my white brothers and sisters must find the answer there. We will work together, but I don't think, as a black woman, I have the answer. I just say if we don't find the answer, we're in serious trouble. So you're not, you don't take a view? No, um, I, I try very hard not to give to anyone the solutions and uh, there, there must be some solution uh, there must be a different way another way that we live and can live together um but um it's not for me to say to my white brothers and sisters it's just the way my white brothers and sisters must find the answers for themselves and that takes um a certain level of uh, spiritual political moral um maturity and do you think that maturity exists in the current Church of England leadership? Well, since I'm not God, I'd like to be, but I'm not. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I think we're moving in the right direction. But um, I, I don't know. Um, I leave that up to, I keep, watch the space. You know? What would you say to those who, who are angry at lack of progress, as they would see it, within the Church of England on, on all sorts of issues, but protect, particularly this one of racism, and would say to you, what, why are you a part of it? Why not Why not just leave? Why not have nothing to do with this? Um, you know, the Church of England has been part of the problem for centuries and hasn't done enough. You know, how do you respond to someone who has that kind of criticism or an institution which, which you're a part of? I mean, I, w- I would say it's not just the Church of England. I think all churches um, are in, could be accused of um, being part of the problem. I, mean, I don't think it's I don't think it's just only the Church of England. Um, so I, I, you know, it's a choice that I've made, and the reasons are have been largely good reasons, but you know, reasons for theology, reasons for space to think, to journey with a group of people, um, that I could quite easily walk away from. But it's not been all bad in the Church of England. Um, you know, I. As an, as, a, as an Anglican, I've enjoyed, despite the problems, being an Anglican priest. And there are those who say, oh, get out of the Church of England. I think you could say the same thing about any church, because um, sometimes I have a real problem with all churches. What are we there for? Um, are we there to liberate? Or are we there to carry on business as normal as usual? And, and I think that's a criticism I could level at all churches. Mm. We were talking earlier about... Um... This, this kind of wrestle you were describing with God of, mm. of asking why and, and how that's a, an ongoing thing for you, as it is, I'm sure, for, for many Christians, and I can relate to a lot of that. Mm. Is there anything in particular right now that's animating your thoughts and your prayers and your uh, discussions with God as to as to why? Well, yeah, I, I, I want to know why the powerful never seem to be punished. They can do what they like. They probably abuse the poor. Um, you know, emotionally and seem to be the moral compass. Um, and that bothers me that um, the powerful just seem to carry on regardless. And that that's a serious issue for me. And and I will keep haranguing God about it. As you look ahead, as I say you've achieved, you've received this lifetime achievement award. You strike me as someone who has still lots of dreams and plans and vision for the future. Yeah, I want to change the world. <laughs> I, I, 
I think I'm joking, don't you? I I I was um I I I I want to be able to make a significant difference to the world, in the world. And I I do not I don't say that lightly. I really mean that. Um, I, I I'm a risk. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian who take risk. I'll take risk. I'm a risk taker. Um, for what I believe in passionately. I believe in goodness. Uh, I believe in love and, and the possibility that we can love, and it doesn't have to be. The world doesn't have to be a place where uh, we find it almost impossible to love and care. And that's not being pious and soft, soft, you know. I, I really believe strongly in the humanity that has been distorted for us, and that we can and must do better. And and I will dream that, and I will eat and sleep that until God calls me home. And it's not yet God. I'm not quite ready. <laughs> Yes, that's the problem with a with a phrase like lifetime achievement award. It makes it sound like it's all over, and it's not over. over. It's far from over. Yeah, it's far from over. I'm still ready to roll my sleeves up and um and do what I the passion. I still feel very passionate about all the things I've spoken about today. Very passionate. Want the best that we can be and should be. And I hate poverty and I hate injustice. When you talk about changing the world, what does that mean? What does that what mean? does that look like? To persuade governments of the world that it is possible for us to live on this planet together, that it is possible to share what we have, and that the world isn't overpopulated. Because I don't want it to sound woolly. You know, the world, the world isn't overpopulated. There's enough food for everybody if we learn to share and. And, and then the, unless we do, the consequences will be great. How do you connect that big vision with you want governments to change with day-to-day -day parish life? Because some might look at that and say, these look like two wildly different things. But for you, they're, they're, they're cohesive. It's, it's the same. It's, yes, local yeah. parish ministry, marrying people, burying people, and also changing the world and changing governments. How, how do you link but that? I think things? each time I made... Someone, whether it's in my capacity as a priest of baptizing and burying and marrying people, they encounter my humanity and I encounter theirs. And I hope in so doing, they see beyond the, the color, I see beyond their color, and we begin to affirm one another's humanity mm -hmm. in a divided world, divided along race and, and, and gender and where women are unsafe in many, safe in many parts of the world, um, and where we, um, we seem to dislike each other intensely with racism and sexism, um, and, and misogyny, you know. Um, I don't believe that that's not possible to change. I'm sorry. I do not believe that God has created us, put us into this world, Oh, by the way, it's just impossible to change. I don't believe that. I think we're told that it's impossible. But I believe that if we're all um, determined that this life as it is being lived cannot be what God wants it for us, then um, it, was, it is possible to change. But it's about looking at the nature of our society, the way we, we, we conduct society, the, the moral vacuum at times. Well, um, then I think that then it is either to roll over and give up and say, oh, it's not possible. I think it is possible for us to change and to create a more loving world. Not a, not a quad, sort of softly, softly, mushy, mushy, ictic world, but a world that say, affirms the humanity of every one of us. Because the truth is, the stark truth is, that unless we, affirm, we uh, if we undermine the humanity of one, we undermine the humanity of all of us. It's a very thought-provoking place to leave it. Every encounter matters, and we really can make a difference. Well, Reverend Canon Eve Pitts, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Profile. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Sam. God bless you. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine. <laughs>